my name is Ruthie. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, make sure you hit subscribe and ring the notification bell so you get a little notification when I make a new video. In today's video, I'm going to talk all about food and my diet, what that's like during a flare up typically while I'm in remission. I want to start by stressing the fact that every single body is so different, especially when it comes to food. And what's an incredibly healing food for one type of person might be the devil to another person. These are things that strictly have worked for me. And these are also things that could change in a year or even in a few months. It's happened a lot where I find foods that work for me and then I overdo it and all I do is eat those things. And then over time I develop a sensitivity to it or I have to find balance in how much I'm eating that particular thing. So remember that I am not a doctor, zero doctorate here. I am just a girl who has lived with stomach problems her whole life. This is what works for me right now. This could change. I could do another video in a few months. I could have completely different foods that work for me then. Our diet changes with the seasons as well. Our diet changes based on our genetics. I'm also not a scientist. <laughs> I like to research and find as much information as I can. But I didn't go to college. I haven't formally studied diet, nutrition, anything like that. I used to want to. That used to be the thing I wanted to go into, but we'll see what happens in the future. I just started working with a nutritionist over at Mount Sinai. So hopefully I'll have a lot more scientific and helpful information in a few weeks after working with her. I think that the only way to find out your trigger foods is by doing an elimination diet. So if you don't know about elimination diet, basically what it is is if you have a feeling that one food might be triggering you, such as dairy, I think that's the most common one, you eliminate it from your diet for typically two to three weeks and see if your symptoms improve or worsen or see how you're doing. If they do improve and you, you're feeling stubborn, what I would do is I would try anyway to slowly introduce it back into my system. But honestly, the odds are is that once that food is eliminated from your diet and you do feel your symptoms improve, you aren't going to be as inclined to introduce that back into your diet. It did take me a lot of tries with certain foods. I don't think that there's any way around it. You eventually have to try some form of an elimination diet to see what could be contributing to your symptoms. I first started experimenting with eliminating foods when I was in high school. And at the time, I just wanted to make it fun and make it sort of like a game because I had no choice. I was really, really sick and I was an athlete. So I would do whatever I needed to do in order to feel healthy and in my best physical form. I tried something called the specific carbohydrate diet, which is very similar to paleo. It's an elimination diet that emphasizes the removal of certain types of carbohydrate containing foods based on their chemical structure. The theory behind this is that complex carbs encourage an overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria in your small intestine if you have IBT. This restricts any food with two or more linked sugar molecules like dairy products, starchy vegetables, table sugar, grains, and most legumes. There is this book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. I'll put a link to it in the description below. If that sounds interesting to you, you should research that further on your own. There's so many different ideas about ways of eating if you have IBD out there. So if you search IBD diet, a million things will come up that you can see what kind of grabs your attention. Because certain diets will list safe foods as ones that I know are not safe foods for me. So I know that that diet probably isn't best for my body. But there are certain things I found where their safe foods and trigger foods match up with what I know mine to be. So those are ones that you look into further. Somehow I completely forgot to talk about the low FODMAP diet. And I know a lot of people with IBD have had relief in their symptoms by following this diet. I will put a link in the description to resources where you can study this further. Gluten is a big one. That is what I cut out in high school, which I thought would be impossible. I've always been a bread and pasta person. But the thing is, is that once I cut it out, I felt so much better. I got bloated way less, started breaking out less. My mind felt clearer. Everything just felt like it improved without having gluten in my life. And of course, you can treat yourself here and there if your body feels like it's up for that. 
But this ties into what I was saying in one of my other videos that if you let feeling good be your first priority, things become a lot simpler. So you'll just start to associate your trigger foods with feeling sick. And eventually they won't be as enticing to you because you will remember what it feels like to feel good. And I think that's another thing is that when it feels like every single thing that you eat makes you sick, at least what I do is I just want to eat everything that's bad for me. Like if I'm going to get sick from eating broccoli, I'd rather get sick from eating nachos, you know? <laughs> so there's definitely some self-destructive tendencies with eating for me. Food journaling is going to be really helpful while you're doing an elimination diet or even without. And not eating so mindlessly where, like at the end of the day, you should be able to list the things that you ate today easily. And of course, that's the goal. But I know that there's days, especially around the holidays and in the winter months where you're like, I have no idea what I ate today, but my stomach is huge and I feel like shit. <laughs> but if you're really determined to make your stomach feel better, this is, I think, the most effective way to do it exercise and eating right if you're feeling motivated to it is incredibly incredibly powerful i go through stages where i'm like very mindful very motivated i do all the work and then i'm like oh i did the work and then slowly but surely i realize like oh no this is work i have to keep doing i highly suggest you get a journal that's specific for like your food, so a specific food journal, just to keep it clean and all in one place. So you can even go through and pre-label your days for the next few months, and you can do breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. If you are really into meal prepping, you can even plan out the foods that you wanna eat. You could have columns on each day of what you plan to eat and then what you actually ate, just so that you can see your expectations versus reality. And over time, you can even start to notice what days of the week either you forgot to log or what days you tend to eat more bad things for you, what days you tend to be most on target with what your plan was, and then have a section at the bottom of each page logging your symptoms and how you felt after each meal, after each thing that you ate. I think because I spent a long time doing this, if my stomach hurts, I know exactly what it was. And I know not everyone's like that. Most of my life, if my stomach hurts, I am burping up the flavor of the thing that did it for the next few days. So like, I don't eat pork. I've never been a big meat person, especially pig, just because I will taste that in my mouth for many days after I eat even one bite of it. Garlic, unfortunately, does that for me as well. Onions, all those kind of fun foods. So say after lunch, your stomach really hurts. Take a moment to sit and taste the inside of your mouth rub your stomach, maybe put your hands there, close your eyes and like tune into it. See if you can feel what it was that's disagreeing with you. And it might take a lot of practice. You might come to you naturally. I don't know, but try it out because I think it'll be really helpful because who knows, maybe what you eat for breakfast every single day is actually really messing you up inside. So I don't want to talk too too much about what my safe foods are and what my trigger foods are just because like I said that could change in the future and because I want to avoid conveying at all that how I eat is right and you should eat the way I eat because no that's just not true I try really hard to eat clean organic cook my own foods this is a lot easier for me after a surgery which is the stage I'm in right now because I remember really clearly what it feels like to be super sick and not be able to eat anything at all. After you get sick, it does make this stuff a lot easier, at least for me. But the basic groups of trigger foods for me is dairy and gluten and sugar, unfortunately. And how much I stick to not eating those things really depends on what my baseline is. I had about two years where I wasn't sick at all. And toward the end of that two years, I was eating whatever I wanted to. Because I would always think back to what the doctors told me is that you'll be able to eat whatever you want, you'll be normal, you'll have no dietary restrictions, blah, blah, blah. Clearly, we know this isn't true by now, but. I would tell myself that when I really just didn't want to think about the food I was eating and wanted to eat whatever was easiest and whatever tasted the best going down. Sugar causes inflammation. So I notice when I eat more sugar, I break out more, my face gets bloated, my stomach gets bloated, 
and I just feel heavier in general. But sugar is the one I think that's the easiest to slip up on because it's in so much stuff. And especially if it's around your time of the month, ladies, it's just like, I need to inhale all of the sugar around me as soon as possible. Yeah, my stomach does not thank me for that at all. <laughs> Also, I mentioned it in another video, popcorn is a huge trigger food for me and I know a lot of other people. Corn in general, but popcorn was the sad one for me. I used to eat popcorn all of the time, all the time. It took me a lot of times getting sick before I decided to listen to my body and stop eating it. And I have to be really careful of not letting a cheat day turn into a cheat week, turn into cheat weeks, turn into my diet is now that. Because <laughs> that's really easy too. It's especially around the holidays, which are coming up. We have to be so careful because I swear every Thanksgiving to Christmas span, I'll have a ton of sugar and have some gluten and some dairy for the holidays. And then I realize every day or multiple days a week, at least I'm cheating a little bit. And then it just becomes your diet. It's not cheating anymore. <laughs> it's just how you eat. And maybe cheating's not the right word. Maybe that's not gonna be helpful for you to speak like that to yourself. I don't have a problem with it myself, but I know of people who do. They don't wanna say that that was cheating. They just wanna use another word that doesn't sound as harsh. But the way my brain works about it is I don't wanna be a cheater. <laughs> so by calling it cheating, it kind of motivates me to not do that. During a flare up, the general rule of thumb is having things with low insoluble fiber. I'm not really sure off the top of my head, but I'll put a list of insoluble fibers up here. It's editing Ruthie. So I've been doing some research about soluble versus insoluble fiber, and it's actually a way bigger rabbit hole than what I was prepared to talk about in this video. So I put some links in the description with sources to help you get started down that rabbit hole if you would like to go. I also found some great YouTube channels with very helpful information, so be sure to check those out. I'll probably make a video in the future about this once I learn more. <laughs> But raw fruits and vegetables in general are really difficult for me. The way I think of it is that however something is when you swallow it is how it's passing through your system and coming out of you. And that's a lot more true for someone with a J pouch just because you don't have the colon as that extra layer to break down the food. Eating with a J pouch, you really have to make sure that when you swallow something, it's gonna be gentle on your intestines. Think about nuts and seeds, lettuce. Can you ever picture getting seeds and lettuces broken down all the way until they're like mush? No, there's always gonna be little tiny chunks of it. Nut butters are a lot safer. For me, they still cause a little bit of indigestion, especially peanut butter, but sunflower seed butter and almond butter when they're creamy are mostly good for me but I still have to watch that I don't overeat them because nuts and seeds specifically are so addicting to me. So I just want to eat all of it. And I know the serving size is supposed to be really small. So it's really hard for me to have just a tablespoon of peanut butter. Like what? So usually I stay away from nut butters and that stuff for the most part, just because I have no self-control when it comes to it and I will eat too much and I'll get sick. But sunflower seed butter, I think is the safest for me. And if I do stick to just like one spoonful, it's fine, no issues at all. So stuff that I eat when I'm in a flare up or recovering from surgery, bone broth. That is the first thing that I'll eat after surgery. A lot of times in hospitals, they bring you that like really gross chemically looking broth. <laughs> That's like ramen noodle broth probably. It's really good. I shouldn't say gross, but my friend Lisa, shout out, has saved my life by making me bone broth, bringing it to me in the hospital. And for my past three surgeries, that's been the first thing that I've eaten is delicious healing bone broth. So I'll definitely make a video in the future for a bone broth recipe, but for now I'll put a link to one that I think is really good. And bone broth is one of those things, kind of like smoothies, like just add whatever you want. Intuitively throwing herbs, spices, vegetables, like whatever sounds good to you, just throw it in there. Let it steep overnight. Wow, perfecto. Ginger tea and turmeric tea. You can get like the packets, but you're not gonna want to once you try real ginger tea and real turmeric tea. 
So I suggest going to the store and getting the roots, like ginger root and turmeric root. The turmeric especially looks like little fingers. It's like really funny looking. I'll also put a recipe for this in the future. But basically what you do is you peel it and then chop them up into long slices, just like this. Put that in some water, simmer it for as long as you'd like. You can do just ginger, you could do just turmeric, you could do ginger and turmeric together. You could add black pepper in there. You could add honey in there. As you might be able to pick up as I'm talking about food, I am the person that just adds spices to literally everything. Like salt and pepper is food. That's a given on anything that I make. And I typically, especially when I'm sick, will add turmeric and ginger to everything, like everything. Because they're such powerful anti-inflammatories. And I'll put some healing benefits for turmeric and ginger up here too. But especially for us, since we have so much inflammation problems, I don't think you could ever overdo it with turmeric or ginger. I love cumin also. I put that in a ton of stuff. I'm not really sure of the healing benefits of it, but if I find them, I'll put them up here. I love coriander, I love paprika, cayenne, black pepper. There was something I read a while ago, black pepper and turmeric helping each other out and they kind of bring out more healing properties in each other. If that's true, I'll put something up here to confirm. So something I make in the mornings now is a turmeric latte. I just take a spoonful of turmeric, beetroot powder, which has some great healing benefits, cordyceps powder, which is a mushroom with a lot of healing benefits, lion's mane powder, another mushroom with healing benefits, black pepper, ginger powder, and either a little bit of honey or a little bit of coconut sugar. And pour some hot water over that, get a hand whisk. Oh my God, if you don't have a hand whisk, get one, please. They're amazing. And whisk it up, put a little oat milk or whatever dairy-free milk I have at the time. And it is just such a great way to start the morning, flushing your body immediately with anti-inflammatories, setting the tone. We're gonna feel good today. We're not gonna be inflamed. We're gonna feel good. So white rice is always good for me. It's lower in fiber than brown rice. Congee is an amazing dish. C-O-N-G-E-E. -E. My friend Lisa would also make that for me. It's like a rice porridge. I'll probably make a recipe video for that in the future also, but I'll put a link to a basic recipe in the description. If you have an ostomy right now, a really fun and helpful trick is that marshmallows thicken your output. So if your output is way too loose and you're feeling dehydrated, if you have some marshmallows, you're welcome. And I do want to mention that there are certain foods that are generally binding for your stool and certain foods that are generally loosening for your stool. So you don't always have to take Miralax or Colace or Imodium to balance the thickness of your output or your stool. If you want to, you can try to do this on your own with food, using food as our medicine like it is. So I'm just going to put up a list here of foods that are generally loosening for your stool and foods that are generally binding for your stool. So also during a flare up or recovery, you wanna make sure you puree as much as possible for as long as you can stand it. Eating baby food or foods that are pureed are just so much easier on your stomach. And it just makes sense if you think about it. There is so much less work for your stomach to do. Think about if you swallow a big chunk of an apple versus swallowing some applesauce. If you swallow a big chunk of an apple, you're either gonna to have to poop out a chunk of an apple and it's gonna like be scraping the sides of your intestines going down, or it's gonna be in your stomach for so long, churning, trying to get broken down, not having a good time. But if you swallow applesauce, it's already broken down and it can just slide right on through, slide right on out, and all is good. My surgeon told me that the best way for your intestines to heal after having a surgery is to be as gentle on them as possible and that is by eating baby food or eating pureed foods. So when I was feeling really sick about two weeks after surgery, I was confused because I was eating all soft foods and I felt like I was chewing them a lot, but you don't always know if you're not chewing them well, to be honest. You can think that you are, but if you're not like super, super mindful about it, you could be swallowing big chunks while watching TV and not even notice. I was just eating chicken and rice and I was very confused as to why I was having issues with that because they're such gentle foods. And he said, you can still have your chicken and rice, blend it up, put it in a blender, use a hand mixer on it, whatever it is, just make it pureed. That was really helpful in this process of recovery. I hadn't been told that by my other surgeons. When I started eating food again, I just 
kept it mostly soft with like applesauce and yogurt and broths. I would still eat rice and chicken and eggs and gluten-free breads. I was just eating things that I thought would be safe for me. And in general, they were, but it was a lot easier to recover. And I think more effective recovering this past time because I ate strictly pureed foods for about two months after this surgery. You can think of it like your organs just went through a lot of trauma. They were just cut open or they were just removed or shifted around or given new jobs, whatever's going on in your stomach. So we just wanna be as nice as we can to our stomach. If it makes my intestines job a ton easier if I just throw some food in a blender, why not do that, you know? And also intermittent fasting. I was doing that before I even knew that it was called that just because it made me feel better to go for long periods of time of not eating. You get a version of this feeling when you puree your foods as well, is that you don't realize how much of your energy is being used digesting food until you're not digesting food all the time. So if you give your body that break from feeding, you'll notice that like your mood is better, you have more energy to go and do things. And it's because you're not spending all this time and energy sitting around digesting food. So if I'm being good, the last thing I eat will be around 6 p.m. And the first thing I eat will be around like 10 or 11 a.m. So this makes my mornings really productive because I'm not still on the toilet from the food I ate late last night. I'm not doubled over on the couch because I ate french fries at midnight. And I can just wake up, go to the bathroom, feel empty, feel clean go for a run, do some yoga, whatever I want to do. And it feels so much easier than slugging your body out of bed and trying to get the food from yesterday out of you. And a lot of times it just feels like too much work. So you just start eating again right away. Or sometimes I think maybe it'll help it along if I put more food in to like push it down. It's like, I don't know if that makes sense, but sometimes it does to me. So now I'll talk about foods and mindsets that I have when I'm doing well or in remission from IBD. So at first when I'm doing well, I just want to do everything in my power to stay well because it's been so recent that I was sick. So that's usually where I get my biggest health kick to like really do all the things and actually do my food diaries and actually not eat the foods that I know hurt me. So some things that I know I can do that always make me feel good is intermittent fasting, like I said, giving my body 12 to 16 hours where I don't put any food in me. Green juice, gluten-free, dairy-free, not overeating, listening to my body when I'm full and actually stopping. Very much easier said than done, especially when there's weed involved. So I don't care talking about weed. I think most of you guys probably smoke weed. Marijuana and CBD are really helpful tools to manage our symptoms. And in a lot of states, if medical marijuana is legal, you can get your medical marijuana card with having a diagnosis of IBD, of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. So look into that if you haven't yet. I do go through stages where smoking during the day actually helps me get through my day and it helps mask my symptoms long enough so that I can get my work done and just fall asleep easily after that. But I also go through stages where I get such bad munchies and if I smoke in the morning, as soon as it starts to wear off, I just want to eat everything that's around me. And then it's counterproductive because yes, the weed might make my stomach feel better for a few hours in the morning, but then after I eat so much food that it makes my stomach hurt for the rest of the day. So it doesn't really make sense to do that. So oftentimes what I do is stick to smoking at night only and have it be like, after I get all my work done for the day, then I can lay on the couch, smoke some weed, watch some TV, unwind and relax. And once I've already dedicated myself to not eating for the rest of the night, because smoking at night also could sometimes trigger those midnight munchies that I was mentioning where you wake up feeling heavy and like you have no energy. So controlling the munchies is a tough one for me, if I'm being real. But if you don't have a problem with that, smoke all the weed, can't hurt. I also generally drink tea throughout the day. I will typically always have a cup of tea. Here she is, always got this baby with me. Yeah, tea just really helps me. I like drinking warm liquids. It's also one of the things like spices. It's just a really easy way to get some benefits from herbs and spices. I know that it is the most effective to drink whole leaf teas. So 
buying like loose teas and putting it in like a tea ball or in your own tea bags is more effective than like the powdered bag that come like in sachets already. But it is a lot more work to do that and find that. And it's oftentimes more expensive also, unless you have like a great local tea shop near you that has good prices. Again, I go through stages where I'm really bougie about my tea and I get the best quality. I get the whole leaves and all that. Lately, no, lately I've just been uh, having the tea bags. I'll put some links to different healing teas that I love. I love chamomile, chamomile blossoms. Mint tea is really good for digestion. As I've said, I do make my own ginger and turmeric tea. And I usually make a lot of it when I do so that I have it for a while. You can also add it to your juice or add it to your broth if you're making that. Add it to your rice if you want some ginger rice. You can get so creative with it. Chewing, 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 chewing. Chewing is the most important thing, I think, especially if you're not pureeing your foods. But even if you're pureeing your foods, it can't hurt to just break it down a little bit more trying really really hard to chew as much as possible and to eat mindfully and i think they go hand in hand i'm about to preach something that i don't practice regularly but i'm gonna preach it anyway because i know it's real it's gonna be best for your body to eat and only eat so that means not having your phone out not watching tv not reading the paper not doing anything else but focusing on the food that you're eating this is like a curious thing to just try if you've never mindfully done that before because I bet it's gonna feel really weird, especially if you didn't grow up in a house where you sat down every night to have dinner with your family or breakfast or whatever meal it was. I did that with my family, but when I sit down to just eat now, I realize that it's so rare that I do this anymore. I've so often will eat in front of the TV or I'll eat listening to a podcast or emails or texting or whatever it is. I'm always doing something and eating. So when you mindfully try to not do something while eating, it feels really weird. It's like an interesting thing to try. I really recommend that you just try it because you notice and you're like, why am I so uncomfortable like just doing this? And why is it just eating? Why is that like the way that I think about it in my head? Food is such a huge part of our lives and it's what fuels our minds and our body. So why don't we give it that respect by focusing on the food that we're eating and appreciating it? And even if you're not religious, I think it's so beneficial to thank your food, especially if you're eating meat. But if you're eating any type of food, living things died and that's what you're eating. And that goes for, I think, everything. If we're including microorganisms and stuff, something has died for you to be eating that. So acknowledging that and giving that the respect it deserves by focusing on the food that you're eating, by noticing the flavors when it hits your mouth versus noticing the flavors while you're chewing it, noticing the flavors as you swallow it, and then noticing the aftertaste. Like there's a lot going on in our foods. The more we pay attention to the way that food tastes and the way that our bodies respond to food, the more interested you're gonna be in cooking and experimenting with different flavors and different healing herbs and ways of cooking also. So that first step I really think is being mindful about the food while you're eating it and afterwards. Maybe like an hour after you eat a meal, notice how your mind feels, notice how your stomach feels, notice how your joints feel. Our food can affect all of these things, but we have to pay attention and at least want to notice or want to observe the effects. And it's so funny how it's such an easy thing to never pay attention to. You don't have to ever pay attention to that because we have so many distractions around us. In America, I don't think we give food, I know we don't give food the right respect that it deserves. It keeps us alive. Food is our fuel. And I remember I never understood the concept of food as fuel until I traveled to Costa Rica and I was eating clean for a month. That was the first time I ever felt like I was getting energy from the food I was eating. And I really think it has a lot to do with the fact that it is so hard to find clean food in America, especially if you don't have money. I've just been a broke girl in her young 20s and it's so difficult to find affordable, healthy food, especially when you have dietary restrictions. So oftentimes it's easier to not eat or it's easier to just eat shitty food and feel bad after. 
But what I've been learning recently is that it's worth it. It is so worth it to spend the extra money on organic food, on clean food, on local food, local especially, because it doesn't matter if something's organic, if it's coming from across the country and in another season than what you're in. I'm realizing that there's so much I want to say about food and diet. This is definitely going to become a series. I will definitely do more of these videos in the future where I can talk more about the yogic way of eating and with a sattvic diet. I can touch upon Ayurveda. I know that that helps a lot of people. I don't study it personally yet. It's just a giant rabbit hole that I've been a little apprehensive to go down quite yet. I know people have had a lot of relief and help by eating based on their Ayurvedic type. So I'll put some links to info and resources if you're curious about that. Treating your stomach right is a hard train to get on and it's very easy to fall off, unfortunately. So to get started, you really have to be rigid and you have to be disciplined in that elimination diet by figuring out your trigger foods, figuring out what's safe. You have to be so disciplined in order to accurately find that out about yourself. And it's always going to be better to do this with a doctor by your side. And even if you don't have a doctor by your side now, keeping that food log and that food journal will be really helpful to your doctors in the future. You can show them the work you've been doing so that they know you want to get healthy and they're going to feel more motivated to help you get healthy. I think doctors are going to be more prone to prescribing you on these heavy biologics like Humira, Remicade, Methotrexate, all of these like harsh drugs if they don't think that you're doing any lifestyle changes. The way I think about it, again, I don't know if this is true, but those heavy biologics are really helpful to me if I don't want to make any lifestyle changes. But if I make the right lifestyle changes and listen to my body about what is okay for me and what is not okay for me, then they're not necessary. I just feel better without those medications. So you can make the decision for yourself. If all of this sounds like way too much, like you don't want to do any of this right now, that is totally okay. You might feel like doing this in 10 years, 20 years, you know? You might never feel like doing this and the medications are, are good for you. They're working for you. Awesome. This is more for people who are really determined to try to feel better on their own without the help of those medications. And I'm not saying that using those medications are bad. And you could be eating healthy and still need the help of those medications. But the way I feel about it is that I just want to know that I'm doing everything in my power to make myself feel good and put myself on the best track. And if I need the medications, I need the medication. It's the same thing with surgery. If I need surgery, I need surgery but I wanna know that I'm doing everything I can to stay away from that and to be as healthy as possible and just to be kind to my body because it puts up with so much crap. <laughs> so when you're starting any sort of diet change, it can be really, really hard at first and some people will give up after a week or after two weeks. I encourage you to push through that first month. It's gonna be a hard month but you have to push through it because it gets so much easier. I swear, I swear, I swear. It's so much harder to not eat dairy for a week. If you're gonna do a week, you might as well just do four weeks and see if you actually feel better because you're not gonna feel better after cutting it out for only a week. And you might rule out something as being a trigger food that actually is a trigger food for you. If you waited a little bit longer, maybe you would see that you did feel better without having that in your diet. And I'm telling you, once you feel that feeling, what it's like to not have those things in your body, it makes it so much easier. And like with popcorn for me, it took me so many times of accepting that it was bad for me, okay, I'm not gonna eat it, and then eating it a ton, and then getting sick again, and you're like, okay, I remember. It's, I just went back and forth so much until, I mean, I'm finally at a point now where I'm not even gonna bother, but it might take you a lot of times going back and forth. Or you might cut them out, feel good right away and be like, hell yeah, I'm never going back to that because this feeling is better than how that tastes going down. But you have to feel it for yourself. Nothing I say is going to get that message across to you more than your own body feeling better. So I go through waves and stages where I'm really focused on my health and then stages where I completely disregard my health. And this is where I feel like the flare-ups are actually blessings because they guide you back on track. 
there are certain things that if you put them in your body, they don't allow you to perform at your best possible capacity. And us having flare-ups that knock us on our ass really just nails that fact home. And it makes it so unpleasant to eat those things that are bothersome to your body, which are also gonna be bothersome to your mind. And it's gonna affect your mental state, it's gonna affect how you show up in the world, the things you create, the people you're around. It affects everything, whether you realize it or not. And I think we're really blessed with these sensitive bodies that are our guide and they keep us on track. Because we know what it feels like to be all the way down here. So we do our best to come back to here. And it's super messy. And it's like this all the time. But it's also like that for everyone. And I just think a lot of people aren't aware of it. I think we've been directly blessed by just shoving it in our face. We can't ignore the facts of reality because our bodies won't let us. But I think most people these days who are so out of tune with their bodies just have no idea what that concept even is. And if you're watching this and you're newly diagnosed and this is all confusing and doesn't really make sense, you're at the very beginning of your journey. And feeling off of the path is part of the path. We have to feel like we're so far away from where we're supposed to be in order to realize where we actually want to be. Because a lot of people can spend their lives climbing up this tree that's really easy to get up and nothing ever really stops them, nothing tells them to do otherwise until one day they wake up in their, in their 40s or 50s and realize that they haven't done anything they want to do. With us, if we try barking up wrong trees, our body will shut down. And I really think that this is true, that we all have a purpose here and we're going to keep hitting walls until we're on the right track and we're barking up the right tree. But I also don't want that to drive you crazy. If you do feel like you're on a path that is your purpose and you keep hitting roadblocks anyway, just trust your instincts. If you're trying to climb up in an industry and you hit roadblocks all the time, but you know in your heart and you know in your gut that this is what you're supposed to be doing, you fight through those roadblocks. Don't let the disease stop you at all. Don't let it distract you or pivot you to other things because you know that's where you're supposed to be putting your energy. But if you're feeling scattered and all over the place and, oh, you try doing this job for a while, get sick and be like, oh, my body hated doing that job. Okay, let me try something else. And then you start doing that job for a while. And that's where this opinion comes from is because that's my story. I was busting my ass trying to do all these different jobs and my body hated the jobs. I never felt healthy waitressing. I never felt healthy being a barista. As much as I love being a barista, I didn't feel physically healthy when I was doing that. I didn't feel physically healthy when I was spending all of my time modeling. So that's really where I decided on the path of yoga because I needed a profession that was going to heal my body and make me feel better and fill up my cup rather than take away. And obviously I'm finding the balance there because Putting too much energy into teaching yoga can also drain your cup and doesn't make my body feel good either. So I'm really just trying to find a balance. I don't know the answer to this at all. I'm 24, I'm still working through all of these career things. As I said in a previous video, I it's really difficult for me to imagine one thing that I wanna do. So I'm just trying to try out a bunch of different things. I'm trying this out. I'm trying out teaching yoga. I'm trying out modeling again. I'm trying out video editing, you know, just different things that spark my interest and just seeing how I respond to that. It's so similar to eating. I really wasn't intending to have a section in here about lifestyle and career, but as I'm talking about it, I feel like it's really similar to eating and to like an elimination diet. You have to experiment with different foods to find out the diet that works for you. Just like you have to experiment with different lifestyles and careers to find what works for you. Wow, I feel like I just put together a little piece of a puzzle. Cool, okay. So the last little thing that I want to talk about in this video relating to food, which I can go deeper into detail in the future if you're interested, but I just wanted to brush upon it now, eating with friends and restaurant eating and social eating. That's a huge part of our lives. I mean, maybe it's not so relevant right now just because of COVID. Hopefully it will be someday soon. <laughs> so for me, by far the safest restaurant I can go to with people is Asian restaurants. Because even if I'm not feeling well, I can always have rice. I can always have miso soup. 
There's always foods that are super gentle there. Mexican restaurants are usually good too. I can always just get rice. Authentic Mexican restaurants will have corn tortillas, so that's all gluten-free. And even American restaurants, I can always just get French fries. I mean, I'm gonna add fried foods into the trigger section because fried foods definitely aren't the best for me, but they are just potatoes. If I'm at an American restaurant, that is probably the safest thing I can get is French fries and just deal with the consequences from the grease later. But the only restaurant that I really is difficult to find anything is Italian restaurants because everything is bread and pasta and cheese and cream and it's everything I can't eat basically. But we're in the future now, 2020. A lot of Italian restaurants have gluten-free pasta now. So that probably doesn't even really apply anymore. Most restaurants in general have options for clean eating unless it's a place where they make a point like we are greasy fattening food and then just don't go there <laughs> and also if i'm feeling really sensitive to foods but i still feel like going out and hanging out with friends i'll just eat before i meet up with them so i know that i'm getting clean food i'm making it i'm eating it and then i can go to the restaurant and just get drinks or talk with my friends and i don't have to worry about eating food that's going to ruin the rest of my night so basically what I'm saying is don't let having food sensitivities and stomach problems stop you from living your life and going out with friends and socially gathering around foods. Yes, it can be really annoying and I don't suggest doing it all the time because it can be really sad to be around a lot of food and friends and just not be able to eat. Sometimes I can get really, really sad and just leave because I'm like, I just want to eat food with friends. Like, why is that such a tall order? But that's only if I'm feeling really sensitive. <laughs> you just got to work with what you got. Just be honest about your problems with food and your stomach with your friends so that they can be there for you. It's really easy to leave out unpleasant facts about your life when you're with friends just because you don't want to focus on the negative stuff. But when those opportunities come up to be a little bit vulnerable with your friends and tell them what's going on, this will just deepen your relationship because it gives them an opportunity to be there for you on a deeper level. And this can also really weed out your friend group and get the quality up because the ones who understand you and see you and hear you, they're going to stick around and they're going to be there for you no matter what. And the ones who don't are just going to fall away. You know, good riddance. <laughs> yeah, I've said this before, but I want to make it clear don't try too hard to keep people around the real ones will understand when you have the energy to go to a restaurant with them and the ones that don't it's fine just let them be <laughs> listen to your body first i can't remember if i talked about this in another video but the spoon theory if you've heard of that I'll put a little description of it up here. The idea is that if you have a chronic illness, you have a certain amount of spoons in a day and the spoons represent your energy. So sometimes if you're really sick, it can cost you most of your spoons just to simply get up in the morning. And then all you can do is make your way to the couch, make your way to the toilet when you need to. And that's all the spoons you have for the day. And the healthier you get, this still applies. You just get more spoons throughout the day. So maybe you make plans to go to dinner one night with friends, but you ended up having a busier day than expected and you have no energy once it turns five o'clock. So if you're being open with your friends about how your energy can change so fast and how one minute you could be feeling good, the next you could be feeling really bad, then they're not going to get mad at you for canceling on them for a dinner plan because they're just going to want you to feel better. Or they could come over and hang out with you on the couch, you know? It's really easy to isolate yourself when you have a chronic illness because you know that nobody ever truly understands, so it stops you from communicating what you're feeling to other people. But if you don't try to communicate how you're feeling, then you're not giving anyone else the chance to help you. And you're not giving anyone the chance to rise to the occasion and be there for you. It's your job to open that door. You can't control who walks through and who turns away. So practicing acceptance there and accepting that the people who are meant to be in your life are gonna be there and the people who aren't will go away. Again, easier said than done as everything in life. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I know I went on a lot of tangents there, but I hope you got the gist that this was about food and food sensitivity. Some takeaways from this is to start your food diary, practice an elimination diet, just get to know what foods are good for you. Eating mindfully, chewing a lot, 
try to not watch TV while you're eating food and see what happens. And if you've done that already, just sticking to that or getting back on that train, listening to your body. And yeah, as always, number one thing, be kind to yourself and don't beat yourself up if you mess up or fall off of the diet you were trying to stick to. It's never too late to get back on. If you mess up first thing in the morning, you don't have to mess up for the rest of the day. You always have the opportunity to eat what's right for you. And the more you do this, the more clear it'll be that food has the potential to be your medicine and not be your enemy. It just takes so much effort and so much learning and patience. I think this is something that's gonna take probably 20 years to even feel like I'm close to figuring it out. I don't claim to know everything or anything about diet and nutrition. I'm learning just as all of you. So I just wanted to share what I've learned so far and I'll continue to share what I'm learning in hopes that it'll help you out. So let me know what you think of this video in the comments below. Let me know if you have any questions about food and diet or if there's anything you wanna hear more about in future videos. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.